welcome to this first session of a real life Eurographics after a long period of not seeing people face to face. It's a great pleasure for me to be uh, to have the honor of chairing this very first session uh, at a graphics conference. <laughs> and this first session is about a topic I really like about rendering. And uh, so we are a little bit different this year than maybe in uh, before the pandemic because we are doing a hybrid setting. Uh, we are not sure yet how this is going to work, but let's, uh, I will try to do the following. So we have three presenters who are all here, thankfully, and they are going to present to you live. Uh, however, there will be a couple of people probably following the stream online and they can ask questions. So there is the Discord channel. So guys and in the audience, people in the audience uh, who are online, you should install Discord or at least have the Discord channel open somehow. And if you have any questions, then there is a channel uh, at the Eurographic server, the Eurographic 2022 server, that is dedicated to each paper. So if you want to ask a question, just type in the question into this channel. And then I will look at it. I have my phone here. So I have Discord installed. And then I can look at this and ask the question for you and then you will get an answer and you can watch it. So I hope everybody online can see this. You, you might just post something in the channel so that you can also see that you, are, uh, that you are online and that everything works, the streaming works and so on. So let's go into the, uh, let's, let's go into the details. So we have um, three rendering papers today and the first one is Progressive Denoising of Monte Carlo Rendered Images. And this is authored by Arthur Feminio, Jeppe Reval Friswart, and Henrik van Jensen. And actually, uh, so Arthur is from Luxion, which is a company in Denmark, and uh, Jeppe is from DTU. And Henrik has his affiliation nowadays, it seems, also Luxion as a company. So Arthur, please step on stage, and you have the honor of being the first presenter at the live view graphics after a long period of pause. Uh, hello, my name is Arthur Firmino, and today I'll be presenting uh, the paper titled Progressive Denoising of Monte Carlo Rendered Images, authored by myself, Jeppe Raul Frisvall, and Henrik van Jensen. So Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo light, transport uh, light transport algorithms such as path, such tracing, path tracing have been have ubiquitous been since, since the introduction of the rendering equation the famous by James Kajia in 1986. By James uh, thanks in 1986. to their simplicity and ability to thanks render to their scenes of complex light and transport. Ability to render However, However these, uh, the, nature the nature of these algorithms, these algorithms is such that is the rendered images that rendered will images contain noise will contain due to its use of Monte Carlo integration. Of Monte Carlo integration. Often, Often, many thousands of samples per pixel are required to reach an acceptable level of noise, and this number is dictated by a 1 over square this relation. Number is dictated by a one Despite the advent relation. of powerful dedicated, powerful hardware the dedicated to ray tracing and variance reduction techniques, uh, it is often not computationally feasible to reach an acceptable level of quality by computing more samples alone, uh, thereby requiring the use of image denoising. More samples. There Monte, Monte Carlo image, image denoising, denoising has been a vital been a component, component of, uh, in, the in the adoption of path tracing, path tracing in the movie, movie industry. industry. Uh, in, recent in recent years, years uh, denoisers, denoisers have, dramatically have dramatically improved in quality improved due to the quality advent of neural networks due to the advent and machine learning. Neural networks and machine learning. Uh, learned denoisers are not learned necessarily perfect, however, necessarily perfect, uh, and they may however, sometimes suffer from bias suffer that from is bias sufficient to be perceived as, perceived as a loss of detail and image uh, blurring. The difference can Uh, this loss of detail can often be seen when comparing uh, denoise and non-denoise images, uh, particularly in the presence of high-frequency details. Uh, in this example in particular, uh, the varying specular reflections from the light post's uh, normal uh, bump map seen in the left image are made smooth and blurred uh, by the image denoiser. 
uh, and then such, such a loss of detail is also observed uh, in the scene's rough wall on the right side of the image uh, to the right of the post. Plotting. This is, uh, uh, so the difference can be made clear by comparing error images of the denoise and non-denoise images. Uh, it can be observed from comparing such images that while denoising reduces error uh, almost everywhere in the scene, there are a few spots, such as in the life post again and the, the, the wall, where the error has actually increased a bit. Plotting the error. So uh, plotting the error of denoise and non-denoise images against the number of samples per pixel uh, reveals a decrease in utility of denoising as and reducing error as the sample count increases. If the sample count is high enough, denoising might be counterproductive and decrease the overall image quality, which is undesirable. Uh, a simple idea to improve denoising in that case uh, would be to denoise only when it reduces uh, the error compared to not denoising. Of course, computing the exact error of a denoise image, as I've done here in this example, uh, requires first rendering a ground truth uh, image, uh, which takes a very large number of samples, and in that case, you want denoise anyways. Uh, however, if we want to know the error of a denoise image, we can use Stein's unbiased risk estimate uh, to compute an estimate of the denoise image error, even without knowledge of the reference image. Uh, so Stein's unbiased risk estimate, uh, also abbreviated as sure, uh, allows computing an estimate of the squared error of a denoise image, even while treating the denoiser as a black box, which is a good treatment for uh, a deep learning based denoiser. And sure has appeared before in computer graphics literature, being used to guide adaptive sampling and optimizing uh, denoising parameters. So the error estimates computing, computed using sure are of practical accuracy particularly as the sample count increases, uh, likely due to the distribution of the sample mean uh, approaching a normal distribution. So the example shown here uh, shows a near one-to-one -one correspondence between the actual error uh, computed using the ground truth and the error estimate using sure. That's in the two images uh, on the left. Uh, so being able to estimate the, the error of a denoise image, how can we use this to uh, improve the final image quality of uh, denoising? So um, we could try to use some of the same principles involved in the derivation of sure to derive an expression for like the optimal per pixel uh, mix parameter between a denoised image and its non-denoised counterpart. So, uh, and that's what we've done here. But while the expression itself is insightful, uh, we cannot directly use it because we can only estimate some of its terms. And so then there would simply be uh, too much noise in trying to actually compute this this value directly. Uh, so one option might be to filter uh, the values of these terms. And this is uh, the approach taken by a, a recent uh, related paper called Ensemble Denoising. But in our work, we decide instead to lend this task to a neural network. So the core idea of our method is um, to first begin with a rendered image, as done here, uh, with a somewhat higher sample count, but not so high, and then uh, denoise that image uh, using, a, in this case, a pre-trained denoiser. And then we take these two images as input, um, and we produce uh, per pixel parameters uh, to mix between these two images. And then finally, we um, mix the two images uh, to compute the final out output that would hopefully be of uh, higher quality and lower error than either of the two images uh, uh, in isolation. So uh, this slide simplifies the pipeline uh, of our work into five steps. Uh, so the first step, as I said, consists of denoising the rendered image, typically with a pre-existing denoiser, and computing an error estimate uh, using sure. Uh, so in our work, we tested multiple different denoisers, including denoisers with different neural network architectures, such as the UNIT and kernel predicting neural networks, and found that our method worked uh, well when applied to either of them. But for most of the, most of the work, we used a UNIT-based uh, denoiser. Uh, and then the denoise and non-denoise 
denoise images along with estimates of their per pixel error, our uh, computer using sure and sample variance respectively, are fed as inputs into a network. Uh, and then this network is a relatively small uh, convolutional neural, le uh, neural network, uh, six layers deep with residual skip connections between the layers. Then this neural network predicts a per pixel uh, parameter, which we call alpha, with which to mix the denoise and non-denoise images. Uh, during training, uh, we performed random swaps of the inputs. So we switched denoise and non-denoise images, like their channels uh, that are input to the network, along with also their error estimates. And we found this prevented uh, the network from falling into the local optimum of just simply returning a value of one, which would correspond to returning the denoise image that is its input. Um, yeah, and that would happen because the denoise image having been denoised would have been already of lower error than the other image. So to ensure that the output uh, is consistent in the limit of many samples, uh, we calculate by how much this new mixed output deviates from the rendered image uh, by computing the t-statistic uh, of the weighted average of uh, each pixel's neighborhood. Uh, and then if the absolute value of this t-statistic uh, is found to be large, meaning that the predicted value deviated a lot from uh, the rendered value, then we uh, scale uh, the mixing parameter towards zero, so that's towards the rendered image, the non-denoised image, and then the final predicted value becomes closer, in that case, uh, to the non-denoised image. And this t-statistic is adaptive to the level of variance in the rendered image, uh, which tends to zero as the sample count increases, provided the variance is finite. Uh, and, this, uh, and then the necessary deviation of the mixed parameter scaling is initially very large, but shrinks as the sample count increases, uh, ensuring consistency. Uh, and then finally, the rescaled per pixel parameter, uh, alpha, is used to mix the denoise and rendered images, and this final image is output. So now I'll uh, show some results. Uh, so in this uh, recognizable scene, uh, we noted that denoising often overblurred uh, some of the details, particularly on the two columns uh, with the rough bumpy surface and view of direct lighting. So on the left, the result of denoising using a high quality production denoiser, we observed a loss of detail uh, that is subsequently recovered by progressive denoising shown on the right. So that's the two columns uh, sort of on either sides of the image. So here to make it clear, uh, we highlight the difference between the images and the ground truth, uh, with red and green indicating negative and positive differences and brightness corresponding to magnitude. And so, so although it's not, uh, and so that should make uh, it a little clearer, uh, the reduction in error. Uh, although it might uh, not be clearly visible here, it still makes uh, sense to use denoising in this scene because um, while the two columns uh, had uh, less noise to them, the background of the scene uh, still had some noise. And then this short clip will sort of illustrate the progressive nature of uh, our denoising. Um, so on the left, uh, we have um, just using the denoiser. Um, and then on the right, we have with uh, progressive denoising. And what's happening here is it's looping through and the sample count is increasing. And what you see is that on the left, um, the quality improves, but then stops improving, uh, particularly on the column. Uh, whereas on the right with progressive denoising, those details uh, sort of came back into the, into the image. Um, so this landscape seen here, uh, containing, containing many small elements and high-frequency details is a notable challenge for denoising. Uh, the small leaves in the distance uh, in particular, uh, they often become blurred out by denoising. This is a problem that progressive denoising is able to address. So as shown in these images, um, our method significantly improves the, error, the, uh, the image quality, so lowering the error, which is seen as the, the brightness uh, in these two images. So here's a video of the same scene. Um, 
So as before, um, on the left, you see that uh, denoising, it, as the sample count increases, improves, and then stops getting better, and particularly a lot of stuff has been blurred. But with progressive denoising, um, you see, you see uh, those details uh, pop back into the image. So um, yeah. So the snippet of, our, of the results of the last two scenes further illustrates the progressive nature and consistency of our method as the sample count increases. Uh, so progressive denoising addresses the decision problem of whether to denoise at higher sample counts but risk overblurring of details, or not denoise but risk noise despite a high sample count. So by allowing an artist to enable denoising and not have to worry about the limitations of denoising at higher sample counts. Uh, and our method uh, also works for other scenes as well, not just the two that I've shown before. So in our test data set, we used uh, these 10 scenes uh, that were, of course, excluded from our trading data set. And we compared our method to uh, existing popular denoiser, in particular, um, oh, Intel Open Image Denoise. And so progressive denoising showed an overall improvement across a variety of error metrics. And it did not depend on whether um, the base denoiser uh, included auxiliary features such as albedo and normals are enough. So uh, Deep Combiner is the title of uh, related work uh, a few years back, uh, which in some aspects is similar to our method. So like our method, Deep Combiner combines estimates from denoise and non-denoise images and uses a neural network to do so. Uh, but unlike progressive denoising, uh, which predicts a single uh, mixed parameter, for a pixel, the combiner would predict a full kernel, uh, which is applied to the residual of the two images. Um, and the application of such a kernel incurs uh, additional computational costs compared to our approach. Uh, a deep combiner, while also being able to improve uh, the quality of image denoising, uh, it, it wasn't consistent and didn't guarantee convergence to the ground truth, um, which is sort of the highlight of our method. And so the, the the uh, error plot here uh, illustrates the difference between our method and related work and to sort of highlight our contribution. Uh, so the result on this slide um, illustrates how progressive denoising performs on a challenging scene uh, with a lot of variance. So this scene took uh, like a million samples to converge. And so um, particularly we know that there was a point where uh, at some point, you might be better with uh, the rendered image, uh, but then eventually progressive denoising started to converge back to the, to the ground truth. Uh, so some limitations of our method. Um, at very low sample uh, counts, that t-statistic that we use to uh, ensure convergence at higher sample counts is not very robust and fails because of uh, insufficiently accurate uh, sample variance estimates due to undersampling of uh, certain light paths. Uh, so many of these artifacts are mitigated by uh, calculating the variance of the weighted average of each pixel's uh, neighborhood instead of just the pixel itself. However, it could still be an issue at uh, low sample counts, such as two, four, eight, maybe. Um, yeah. uh, so uh, our method doesn't specifically address uh, temporal coherency. Um, we briefly investigated how it performs, and we basically found uh, no particular uh, improvement. Uh, so I think this video is, uh, oh, it's already going. It's cycling just between denoising and progressive denoising. And so those, those temporal artifacts that we saw with denoising, we still see with temporal, with progressive denoising, but, but we did not specifically address them as it was outside of the scope. Uh, but a question remains, like if you use a temporally coherent based denoiser, and use progressive denoising on top of that, would it still converge to the, to the, uh, would it still be temporally coherent? Uh, so to conclude uh, this presentation, uh, so progressive denoising is a technique that improves denoising by incorporating it only when it is beneficial over the non-denoised image. Uh, it makes denoising asymptotically unbiased, ensuring convergence to the ground truth as the sample count increases and it can be used on top of pre-existing high-quality image denoisers, as we've done in our experiments. Uh, and thank you very much.
thanks a lot for this very good presentation. And I see that more and more people are coming in from the champagne-induced uh, tiredness <laughs> <laughs> and, and having seen all the nightlife of Reims. Uh, what a great city, I have to say. So, are there any questions from the audience, please? You're still too tired. It's hard to see here. <laughs> ah, yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Gurpreet, so thanks for the nice presentation. Um, what is the minimum sample count where you have, where you start doing the denoising? Like, is it, like you mentioned, like two SPP is like difficult to handle, so where does it, like, what's the minimum sample count you need to give to start doing the denoising process? Um, uh, with regards to the, to the limitations, like the artifacts we saw with progressive denoising, um, I would say it wouldn't make much sense to apply below uh, 32 samples uh, per pixel. I see. Um, because then that's sort of still within the regime where uh, denoising will still improve uh, the image quality, at least in the scenes that we tested. It's, of course, scenes dependent. But um, yeah, as I would say after that point, progressive denoising our method uh, then makes more sense. Because that's beyond that point is when you see um, you know, you might notice that denoising is making the image better in a lot of places, but in some places it's over blurring and um, then you might want a method like ours. And, and thanks, and when you compute the statistics, it's the statistics. So once, let's say you are at 32 SPP, you have denoised the image. So then the statistics are computed with respect to the pixels and the samples, like to bring it back to, so that it doesn't deviate. I didn't get that part. Uh, so the T statistic is computed um, after uh, like mixing uh, the denoise and non-denoise. So the, the neural network computes like a preliminary mixing parameter. Um, and then uh, while that parameter does very well uh, by itself, um, we couldn't um, sort of ensure that uh, the, the neural network being a bit of a black box, we couldn't ensure that uh, it would uh, have that convergence property that we wanted. So putting this uh, t-statistic test, uh, that, that way we're, we're able to, to guarantee that and not have to worry about it. Okay, thanks yeah. a lot. So maybe a trivial question, but you're assuming normal distribution of the mean. I mean, is this automatically given, or how many samples do you need until you can assume it's really normally distributed? Um, it, it, it's, uh, I guess, it's an like a, an approximate. It's an assumption that's approximated, provided the the variance is finite. But um, it would really depend, I think, on on the scene and the the variance of the thing uh, that you're taking the mean of. Um, so, based at least on uh, how well the sure estimate does, I would say around like 32, 64, and higher. Um, that that assumption might become true, but. Uh, that is, that's an assumption that's often made in other papers as well that's not very often um, investigated. And so, um, yeah, and it's not true if the variance is infinite, which can be the case. So, you're right. But the method seems to work even before that assumption holds. So. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, over there, please. Ah, over here. Hello. Um, <clears throat> so, if I understood correctly, you take the rendered image, you take the denoised uh, image, and you combine them together with your progressing uh, uh, algorithm. Um, what if you iterate? Does it stabilize to a, a better denoised image in the end, or like mm. 10 times, 100 times? Right, like so if I compute an error estimate of the mixed image, and then yeah, uh, I, I don't think I've actually ever tested that. So uh, that remains an, an open question. Uh, okay. Very, very interesting question, yes. So there was a question over there, I think, yes. Yeah. Um, do you have uh, some estimate of complexities of the different blocks? Um, the algorithm? Yeah. So uh, with regard to computational complexity, um, I would say that the most expensive part of our method is um, uh, computing the sure estimate uh, because uh, sort of deno the denoiser we treat it as a black box and we don't have a closed expression for its derivatives, uh, we have to do this 
Monte Carlo way of uh, computing the Schur um, value, like that error estimate. And so that requires multiple iterations of the denoiser. So we might have to run the sort of the base denoiser uh, like four times. And so that, that is uh, the biggest computational cost. Um, and then the rest the other parts are more negligible compared to, to that section. So, so, so in practice, I mean, how fast would you generate? So this is an offline method, right? Yeah. So how, how, how much time would you invest into that compared to the uh, original renderer? Um, so it, the whole thing itself, if you run it on the GPU, um, it's around like 100 milliseconds. So denoising is quite good. So it could still be used interactively. Uh, but of course, the, um, the motivation for the method is, is more for like final image rendering, um, where you, know, you might not want to have to make the choice between denoise and non-denoising. Yeah. OK, great. Any more questions from the audience? I haven't seen anything on the Discord, so here, if you hear me in the online audience, please feel free to ask questions and also participate in this event. Um, meanwhile, so can it happen, since, since you're kind of trying to detect what is noise and what is feature somehow, can it happen that it actually mistakes actual image noise for, features, for, for this kind of features and then mixes in back noise that originally would have been filtered out correctly? Um, I think the uh, the method is is mostly driven by uh, the error estimates. So in that case of um, if you have noise, uh, it, it wouldn't be mistaken as features because uh, in the the variance estimate of the rendered image, uh, it would have a higher variance where you still see noise. Uh, so that that shouldn't uh, be the case. But you still have the neural network on top, which could be fooled, right? That's true. Um, so I, I haven't done any, I guess, adversarial uh, study on it uh, to see how easy it would be to fool. Well, that might be an interesting <laughs> thing to try. Any more last questions from the audience? OK, then thank you again. Thank you for this nice presentation answering our questions. Thank you. So, um, I haven't introduced myself, actually. My name is Michael Wimmer from TU Wien in Vienna, Austria. And actually, now it's a great pleasure to introduce the next speaker to me, Anna Dodik, who started out as a student in our, in our, at our university and worked as teaching assistant here. And then she made her way to ETH and finally to Meta. And, uh, but she is still a master student, so this is amazing. And she's presenting her work here. Uh, and, and the work is Path Guiding Using Spatial Directional Mixture Models. Uh, this is a, a CGF paper, and it's co authored uh, with Marios Pappas from Disney Research, and from Zengis Özzerelli from Cambridge and Google, and with Thomas Müller from NVIDIA. So we have a multi-cooperation paper here. That's really amazing. I really like that. So please, Anna, give your talk. OK, I can start. I guess they'll come up at some point. Hi, my name is Anna. Uh, I'm currently a computer vision engineer at Meta. I've actually graduated uh, from my master's. So this paper here was my master's thesis uh, back in sort of 2020. Um, and uh, we did it with my amazing co-authors that I want to give a huge shout out to. So Marios Papas, Cengiz, Ostirelli, and Thomas Müller. Uh, this work is on uh, path guiding. Um, so yes. Oh. So some AV issues here. Uh, okay, so let's get started. Okay, as many of us know, uh, watching, uh, waiting for rendering algorithms to produce the final result is often akin to watching paint dry, uh, with modern movie productions requiring uh, hundreds of CPU hours to produce the final result. Um, so why is rendering so slow? Um, in rendering, we estimate the value of a pixel uh, by shooting rays from uh, 
the, from that pixel into the scene. At each intersection point, uh, we need to account for the radiance leaving that intersection point towards the camera. The value of this radiance depends on um, the incoming radiance from every possible direction to that point, uh, as well as the material properties, i.e. the BSTF at that point. These values are then multiplied together. Lastly, uh, we need to integrate all of these values to get the final pixel color. Because we cannot calculate this integral in closed form, uh, we replace it with a Monte Carlo estimate, which corresponds to shooting more rays uh, from that point into the scene and summing up their contributions. So, in order to get one estimate of one pixel, uh, we, shoot a ray, we begin by shooting the ray into the scene. Next, using some strategy, we choose the next direction to shoot the ray in. And we continue doing this until we hit the light source. As you may imagine, uh, we need to repeat this process many millions of times in order to get a complete estimate of the image. So, one way of accelerating this process is by being smart about uh, where we shoot the ray uh, next. We call these sampling strategies. So, formally speaking, as we are using Monte Carlo integration, um, we can rely on the idea of important sampling to help us choose the probability distribution uh, of our rays. So important sampling tells us that ideally, uh, we would shoot the rays um, with probability exactly proportional to our integrand, i.e. the product of the material response and, and uh, the incoming gradients. Um, so let's look at some possible ways of tackling this problem. Two common strategies are to shoot rays either proportional to the material response or the weighted average of the material response and the light source. Um, using these as sort of a proxy for the product. Um, alternatively, other popular methods rely on machine learning to learn the incoming gradients, uh, possibly averaging it with the material response. Our method falls into the third category where we attempt to learn and sample the product of the two directly. Um, similar to prior work, our method allows us to learn the incoming gradients and the material model separately uh, and then multiply the learned distributions together during rendering. Let's first look at how we learn the incident radians. So, to put our method in context, uh, we'll begin by looking at how previous methods represent the incoming gradients, um, and then sort of look at what we do differently. So, um, first we will look at practical guiding, uh, practical path guiding. Practical path guiding discretizes the scene spatially. Then for every spatial cell, uh, it learns one directional distribution represented as a quad tree. No matter, uh, yeah, for mapping between the unit square and the sphere, it uses the cylindrical mapping. Uh, it is important to note that no matter where within this uh, spatial cell we are, uh, the directional distribution does not change. This is bad because, as you may imagine, um, due to small scale variation, um, the directional distribution can change quite a lot depending on the scene. Similarly, Borba and others uh, use a number of cache points at which they learn the directional distribution. Directionally, their distributions are represented as Gaussian mixture models. Um, and again, no matter where within this uh, spatial region you are, um, the directional distribution will be that of the nearest cache point. Lastly, the work of Rupert and others introduces significant improvements um, to the previous methods. They, they make the assumption that for every mixture component in some neighborhood, uh, the light is arriving from approximately the same point in the scene. This allows them to assume that the light direction changes linearly 
um, with respect to the light source. And using this information, they can modify the sampling distribution to account for parallax, wherever this assumption holds. Now, while this assumption, uh, this heuristic, is very powerful in many ways um, and, and works very often, there are certain somewhat rare edge cases uh, where this heuristic breaks. So, for example, this assumption does not work if you introduce lensing um, effects into the scene, such as the case of this glass bowl. Which brings us to our method. We've seen the correctly accounting for the spatial directional uh, correlations of the radiance distribution is an open problem. To this extent, we propose uh, an alternative data-driven approach. Then spatial directional Gaussian mixture models learns a single joint distribution uh, of the incoming radiance over the entire scene. Uh, during rendering, we are given a, a, a point, a position in the scene, and we need to sample a direction. Um, in other words, we need to obtain a directional sampling distribution conditioned on the spatial location. Um, luckily, a Gaussian mixture model can be conditioned in closed form. Note that in this formulation, the, any existing correlation between the spatial and directional uh, distribution, uh, the, yeah, the spatial and the directional dimensions gets encoded explicitly into the covariance matrices of the mixture model. This results in the directional distribution varying smoothly as a function of space. Um, in practice, it is computationally prohibitive to have Gaussians that extend throughout the entire scene, uh, which is why we enforce locality by placing them in an acceleration data structure. Um, so, now that we have the high-level idea, we can sort of get into the nitty-gritty details of how to do this uh, by first thinking about how we can parametrize Gaussian mixture models on the spatial directional manifold. Um, for that, we can simplify and start off by looking at how to parametrize Gaussian mixture models on the sphere manifold. First attempt at this might be to learn a Gaussian distribution on the unit square and then map it to the sphere using, for example, the cylindrical mapping, similar to what previous work did. Um, however, the cylindrical mapping is global with no regard to where the mean of the distribution is. Um, this introduces discontinuities where the manifold is cut, as well as heavy distortions near the top and the bottom of the sphere. Uh, furthermore, the cylindrical mapping makes the conditioning operation nonlinear on the sphere. So in the Euclidean space, like here, uh, moving the condition x moves the distribution condition on x in a straight line. However, um, when mapped to the sphere, this line becomes a spiral-like curve. This means that our algorithm needs to not only learn the motion, but also needs to learn how to undo this mapping. So instead, our work builds heavily upon tangential Gaussian mixture models. Uh, the intuition behind this approach is instead of having a single global map, each Gaussian uh, mixture is centered within its own map. Um, to understand how this idea works, we can look at one single tangential Gaussian. So we begin by defining the mean of the distribution as some point on the sphere. Um, Next, we define a Gaussian distribution in Euclidean space, which has as many dimensions as the manifold itself. So in this case, two. Um, note that this distribution has to be centered around the origin. Um, and this is because we will treat this Euclidean space um, as the tangent space of the sphere 
at, at the mean of that um, distribution. So then using the so-called exponential map in the sense of differential geometry uh, and its inverse, uh, we can map data points from the tangent space to the manifold and back. Um, the exponential map transforms tangent space vectors to points on the manifold itself. Um, the reason for using the exponential map and not some other map um, is that lengths of tangent space vectors equal to the lengths of the corresponding geodesics on the manifold. Now, this is very important when we talk about learning because a covariance matrix that's optimized in the tangent space like this, using the exponential and logarithm maps, corresponds to the true intrinsic covariance of the data on the sphere. So as we've seen before, tangential Gaussian mixtures, uh, tangential Gaussians can be easily combined into mixture models. Um, note that in this approach, uh, as, as this image nicely de demonstrates, um, due to the exponential decay of the Gaussian, most of the mass of the distribution is located uh, in the part of the tangent space where the distortion of the map is the lowest. As, we've, uh, as we're doing learning in 5D instead of just on the sphere, we also need to define the spatial directional manifold and its tangent space. Um, this space can be defined as the Cartesian product of 3D Euclidean space and a two-sphere. So you can imagine taking a sphere and placing it at, at every point in R3. Um, the exponential map for this spatial dimensions reduces to simple addition, and for the spherical dimensions, uh, it remains the spherical exponential map. Uh, going back to the problem of conditioning, we see that the motion of the distribution remains a straight line on the surface of the sphere, unlike with the cylindrical map. So, now that we've sh shown why tangential Gaussians represent a suitable parametrization for our problem, uh, we can get into uh, how to actually train them. So, in standard DM, we follow a procedure similar to this one. So for every sample, we will accumulate and compute certain statistics uh, that will allow us to compute the new weights, means, and covariances. Non-Euclidean EM proceeds similarly. Um, however, we have to compute the means and the covariances separately. So that means that we have to recenter the distributions around the new means and then repeat the same process again to compute the covariances. This implies evaluating the Gaussian probabilities and posteriors, as well as the exponential and logarithm maps twice during the optimization procedure, causing a potential performance bottleneck. Now, if it's not clear why we need to do this uh, procedure twice, I'm gonna get more into that. So, to illustrate why this is necessary, um, we can use this, an example of a toy data set generated from this isotropic tangential Gaussian. Um, we wish to optimize some other distribution seen at the top of the sphere here to the data on the side of the sphere. Um, once we map the data, the, the data set to the tangent space, however, it is no longer isotropic due to the distortions of the map. If we were to naively optimize the covariance matrix um, in that tangent space, it will give us a covariance matrix which will include the distortions of the map. As you can see, the covariance matrix is squished in this example. Instead, our method allows us to calculate the covariance matrix in the original tangent space and then corrects for the distortions of the map using a first order Taylor approximation. Without going into too much math, um, our solution is simply approximating the exponential and logarithm maps using a linear function. 
these approximations aren't necessary in the case of Euclidean exponential and logarithm maps uh, because they are linear operators. So with this approach, um, we gain a speed up of two um, during training. Um, having shown how to define and optimize the model, uh, we can now integrate it into sort of a gradients guiding rendering method. Um, so here we see the results of you know, rendering using the simple cylindrical mapping and switching to the SDMM version, we can see that the result improves significantly. I will flip back and forth between the two versions. So cylindrical mapping, SDMMs. Here we can see the plot of the difference between the two mappings. The x-axis represents the number of render iterations and the y-axis, which is logarithmic, uh, represents the error at that iteration. Zooming into uh, one of the scenes with sort of a large improvement, uh, we can get the same quality with 25% fewer paths. Okay, so we've only talked about learning the incident radiance. What about the material response? So on the left, you will see the Fong material model, and on the, light, uh, on the right, our learned model using only uh, three Gaussian components. The material model usually depends on the direction of the incoming ray, uh, which means that as the incoming ray direction changes, so does the cone of possible outgoing directions. Note that back in radiance learning, we were conditioning on the spatial location. Oh. is broken. <laughs> Note that back in radiance learning, we were conditioning on the spatial positions. Here we can condition on the incoming ray directions, as well as spatially varying uh, material properties, such as, for example, roughness. Now you will have to believe me, uh, these two move and they look quite similar. <laughs> so once we're able to learn different materials, we can extend our model to perform product sampling. Um, so left, we see the light distribution learned in the world frame of the scene, and right is the learned material distribution in its local shading frame. Uh, luckily, when learning in the tangent space, uh, we can easily rotate the distributions to bring them into the same coordinate frame. Now that they're in the same frame, we can look at how to multiply them together. Um, so let's say that these are the two distributions we wish to multiply, drawn on the same sphere for convenience. We start by using our uh, first order Taylor approximation to bring the covariance matrix from one Gaussian um, into the tangent space of the other one. Um, then we can use the closed form solution for multiplying two Gaussian distributions. And lastly, we can map the distribution back to its own tangent space, uh, again using our approximation. Now, knowing how to compute the product, we can apply this algorithm in practice. So, let's look at some results. Um, by looking at the mean absolute percentage error in equal sample count comparisons um, between our radiance only guiding and our product guiding, we see that the product guiding produces lower variance per array. So, however, computing the product uh, using SDMMs introduce, introduces a significant computational overhead. Here we will look at speedups compared to our baseline practical path guiding. As you can see, uh, in most cases, um, speedups for radiance guiding are comparable, if slightly worse, uh, when compared to PPG. And in fact, the overhead of computing the product uh, actually makes product guiding perform slightly worse. Um, so, as you imagine, on scenes with large light sources, like this one, our algorithm has little to no effect compared to the baseline, as the incoming gradients distribution varies little as we move locally in space. In fact, due to the computational overhead of our algorithm, um, we perform ever so slightly worse uh, than the baseline here. However, on scenes 
uh, the scenes where we perform the best are the ones where the directional distribution varies a lot as a function of space. Um, so in this scene, um, the spatial and the directional dimensions are highly correlated due to the purposefully scaled down emitter. This results, uh, results in a rendering efficiency improvement of three times. Here we can take this idea to the extreme by making uh, the ceiling highly reflective and turning the scaled down emitter upside down. In terms of raw numbers, our algorithm achieves a speed up of around an order of magnitude uh, compared to our baseline on this specific scene. So moving on to equal time comparisons with um, the method of Rupert and others, we see that their method is able to render far more uh, samples in the same time compared to ours. In fact, their method outperforms ours on the majority of the scenes on equal time comparisons. However, as noted previously, in scenes with significant lensing, uh, our method seems to perform better despite the computational overhead. So we can move on to some ideas for future work. In general, the most important uh, step to making this algorithm more practical is reducing the computational overhead. Um, possible avenues for this include finding better ways for computing the exponential and logarithm maps, um, reducing the memory bandwidth, but also exploiting things like cache coherency, um, uh, because our implementation currently allocates each mixture separately, which is not great. Um, additionally, we found that five-dimensional mixtures happen to be very um, sensitive to initialization and local minima due to the curse of dimensionality. Getting them to work in practice required a lot of engineering uh, effort and trial and error. So, um, moving on, we believe that our method can be quite easily combined with that of Rupert and others, uh, as they are actually orthogonal to each other. Um, and this, of course, brings us to sort of the North Star uh, question of path guiding, of when and how much uh, compute to assign to path guiding. Some other applications for this method include volumetric and spectral uh, rendering and guiding. Um, so the spatial distribution of light within a volume is quite blurred, lending itself well to being represented using Gaussians. Um, alternatively, one can imagine optimizing a different set of mixture weights one per color channel, or representing the spectral component of light as an additional dimension in the mixture model. Um, lastly, an avenue I'm very excited to explore personally uh, is using the exponential and logarithm maps for learning on meshes. Um, for this, of course, we would need a way of computing these maps much faster than is currently possible. So, in summary, we presented the general representation for important sampling of spatio-directional illumination effects. We represent the radiance as a joint spatio-directional Gaussian mixture. And the same framework allows us to represent not only the radiance, um, but also spatially varying BSDFs, uh, and it allows us to perform product sampling. Lastly, all of this is enabled by uh, using our first order Taylor approximation of the exponential and logarithm maps. So that's that for my presentation. Uh, we hope you've learned something new. We know that we have while working on this project. Um, and yeah, again, many thanks to my co-authors. Um, and I'm ready to take some questions now. Be nice, please. <laughs> Thank you, Anna, for this inspiring presentation. I like very much how, uh, how you find a new method, and even if it's not uh, so extremely fast or much faster than previous work in the beginning, it still gives very insightful uh, observations, and, uh, and you don't try to hide this, that it's maybe sometimes not faster. That I, I think this is really great. Um, do we have questions from, from the audience over there, please? Uh, yeah, where's the microphone guy? I can repeat the question. Microphone guy, please, over there. <laughs> Hi. I really like your work. It's hard work. Um, 
Just a question about um, this computational overhead. Can we just try to use other distributions like von Mises Fisher distribution, which can be defined in global space? And if I understand correctly, we don't need to have uh, to have some kind of transformation, which can take a lot of time. Also, we can use some kind of anisotropic distribution for simulating covariance matrices like a normal distribution. What do you think about it? I think that's a very uh, good question. So uh, the reason we didn't go for something like von Mrs. Fisher's distributions here um, is because we needed to sort of have a joint uh, mixture model with a joint covariance so for the spatial dimensions and the directional dimensions. And we weren't sure how to reformulate the von Mrs. Fisher distribution to fit into that framework. And I think it would actually probably just come down to doing the same thing with uh, an isotropic Gaussian. Uh, the idea of using an isotropic Gaussian, I think, is, is reasonable. And I think when um, you, know, you have things like SIMD intrinsics and, and you're trying to fit as many things into registers, reducing the dimensionality from five to four might actually help a lot. Um, so I, I don't know, we haven't actually gotten around to trying that, but yeah, thank you for that question. More questions, oh, we're back there. Hey, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I have two questions actually. One is, um, I assume you are using uh, BSDF sampling, to combine your path guiding, uh, do you do that with a constant factor or do you change it over time? Or? Yeah, good question as well. So uh, right now we have it set as constants. Uh, there are different constants for product guiding and, and radiance guiding. So for product guiding, we, are, we, we use a lot less uh, BSDF sampling, uh, but we don't do any sort of you know, adaptive MIS learning uh, type thing. Um, we do, I mean, it's orthogonal to this. You could do the same thing as practical path guiding and sort of optimize it per spatial cell. Uh, we just didn't um, think it was necessary for, for this particular paper, but in practice, it's a good idea, yes. Right. And uh, you said that in practice, you have a, a special subdivision where you place the Gaussians. Do you, um, do you combine Gaussians between uh, if a point is between two subdivisions, or that's not how? Ah, uh, so the, the way it works right now is um, each spatial cell receives the samples for itself and sort of its neighboring cells. There's sort uh, of a, a filtering type. Uh, kind of like splatting. The, exactly, okay. that's exactly what we're doing, Great. yeah. Thanks. So um, you talked in the last slide about spatially varying BSDFs. I mean, can you? Say a bit more about that, how well they work. Is there anything special you have to do, or does it just work? Have yeah. <laughs> this more? So I, I skipped over that a bit, but it works very similar to the, um, to the radiance guiding uh, in the sense that we also sort of discretize or like split up the, the parameter sets of the um, distributions and put them in, in a bit of an acceleration uh, data structure. Um, so there is a sort of spatial directional um, Gaussian that's, you know, in one dimension a parameter of the BSDF and in the other direction the outgoing uh, directions. Uh, right now we've only tested it with up to sort of five dimensions totally because that's what our framework uh, was, it, it was easy to do with, with our code. Um, so I, I don't remember right now, but sort of the incoming directions and a few uh, BSDF parameters. Um, and it's obviously a thing you can tweak, sort of how many uh, distributions you want to use, um, and and um, we, we try to keep it very low, so one or two maximum um, resulting conditional Gaussians that we have to multiply with. Okay, any more questions from the audience? Yeah, there, there was we, one question. Uh, there was one. Oh, yeah, another one, last one. I think just a regular question. Uh, did you try to use this algorithm for control variates? So, uh, you know, this is pretty similar technique for decreasing the variance, and I think that Thomas Muller also did the same uh, thing in his last work with neural networks. 
maybe you made some experiments with control variates? Mm, uh, we didn't. I did try to sort of use this for radiance prediction uh, a long time ago, but it just happens to be too blurred. Um, I, I know some of, of those papers also um, tell you when, when you can use the distribution when, once it's blurred enough. Uh, we haven't actually tried that. But control variates, no, I, I do think it might be, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's probability distribution, so I guess it's, uh, you could probably come up with better representations if you, if you were just subtracting things. Okay, thank you. So thank you again. Yes. So that brings us to the third. Uh, today I will talk about our paper titled Fast Ray Tracing of Scale Invariant Integral Surfaces. Oops. All right. Uh, implicit surfaces are defined with a field function and a threshold value. And by querying a point in space, we are able to determine whether this point lies on the surface or is inside or outside. Uh, this volumetric definition has advantages for many ad applications like 3D printing. Uh, and though they can be used for modeling soft organic shapes, they are notoriously difficult to model with. So to overcome this uh, and to easily model and control these shapes, we work with density field definitions. Uh, here you see a 2D example of a Gaussian density function. Uh, by summing sever several of these Gaussians in this uh, simple example, we have a continuous field. Uh, you can see on the image, as we change the threshold values, we get a family of smoothly blended surfaces. Uh, the particular surfaces we focus on are called scale invariant integral surfaces. Uh, they are defined by smoothing a, uh, smoothing a distance of the skeleton with a Gaussian shaped kernel. Uh, here you see a line segment skeleton with reduced information at the endpoints. And this definition allows us to model complex objects with uh, sphere cones, like this. And plugging this information to our smoothing function, uh, we get a smoothly blended surface with sharp details. Uh, to go over this field formula, we start with the distance to the skeleton uh, divided by local radius to get the scale distance. Uh, then we integrate this distance over the skeleton with a Gaussian-shaped kernel. Uh, summation blending with this integral definition gives us independence from skeleton subdivisions. That is, uh, when we add line segments together, uh, we don't get uh, bulges at the junctions. And here you see the two Gaussian shapes polynomial kernel families we use. Uh, we done without uh, compact support. Uh, we can further control the shapes by changing the kernel degrees and scales and using this uh, polynomial, oh, sorry, Okay. Uh, using this polynomial kernels allows us to have a closed form solution for this integral. So we have closed form solution for both field functions and their gradients. Uh, so our aim is a fast rendering of these smoothly blended objects with small details, and we achieve it by using low degree iterative polynomial interpolation. Okay, so I will go over some of uh, previous work and some general information about how to visualize implicit surfaces with ray tracing. Uh, we, for ray tracing, we start with a ray equation and we plug our field function into this, uh, this ray into our field function and we find the zero crossing along the ray. Uh, as these formulations usually don't admit a closed form solution in most cases, we need numerical methods for to find these intersections. And now I will go over a few well-known previous methods. The first one is called sphere tracing, and it's a ray marching method where we march along the ray direction uh, with a guaranteed step size that won't cross the surface. Uh, this guarantee comes from the usage of a global Lipschitz constant that is a bound on the derivative of the function. Recently, this method was improved by using a local Lipschitz function along the ray direction. So that improves the step sizes along the ray, so we are able to take larger steps, improving the computational time. And for scientists, science distance functions, uh, it's possible to use sphere tracing without calculating a Lipschitz constant because, because of the fact that the norm of the gradient of a science distance function is one everywhere, therefore it's by definition, and therefore we can use it for 
our bound for the formula. So when we have a proper sine distance function, we can take the field value as our step size and uh, just take the Lipschitz constant as one and uh, step along the ray. Uh, another method I will uh, focus on today is called, uh, it is a polynomial approximation method for a given ray. Uh, we can use the field function values and directional uh, derivatives at the uh, end points of a given interval along the ray and then uh, find the roots uh, directly on this approximated polynomial. This method uh, allows us to have uh, fast uh, solutions for the intersection problem, but uh, it can introduce uh, approximation error depending on the interval sizes. As the interval sizes get smaller, we, we get closer to the roots. Uh, and for other cases, as we uh, frequently encounter in our method, uh, this uh, approximation method uh, may cause losing some roots. For example, uh, in this example uh, configuration, we completely lose a root that, is, that has a small detail. And in our uh, examples, it can mean that lo we lose a sharp detail on the object. So they get smoothed out. And the last method I will talk about is a, po a molecular uh, rendering method that uses Gaussian density and the point uh, primitives. Uh, here they calculate a distance estimate for a single point primitive with a Gaussian. And they showed that uh, we can calculate a distance estimate for the single point primitive by inverting the kill field function. That is, we plug the uh, field function back into this uh, inverted kernel, and we get a distance estimate. Uh, the important uh, point about this method that they show that this also holds for the final summed field. So that is when we sum these Gaussians together, and we plug the summed field back into this inverted kernel, we get a distance estimate. And this distance estimate has the same rules as the original field, so that we can use it for sphere, uh, we can use it for root finding, and as it's a distance estimate, we can use it directly for sphere tracing. Uh, so in our method, we extend this idea from Gaussian kernels to polynomial kernels we use, and we also extend it to line segment primitives from their point primitives. Uh, and since our distance is a scaled one instead of the Euclidean distance, we need to uh, also convert this distance into our scale distance. Uh, for, uh, to start, we begin with the screen space acceleration structure, as uh, similar to previous methods, but also extended for the line segment primitives. Uh, for a large uh, scene with many primitives, it is important to consider the, only the primitives that are uh, in a given area on the screen. So we can have thousands, even millions of primitives in a screen, so we need to filter them. Uh, we use a structure built dynamically on GPU uh, while raster, rasterizing the primitive supports. Uh, first, we generate a code aligned with a segment direction with, uh, using a geometry shader. And then uh, we intersect our array with this sphere cones. Uh, so we register the entry exit points in a linked list as shown in this image. Uh, this allows us to have a constant time ex access to segment primitives that overlap a given point along the ray for root finding. Uh, to calculate this distance estimate for uh, line segments, uh, we assume that we have an infinite line segment disregarding the effects of the uh, radius variation at, and the and uh, segment and points. Uh, in this case, evaluating the, uh, for this infinite line segment case, we can just evaluate the integral, and since we use a polynomial kernel that's, that is just a, a similar kernel with a different degree, so we can invert this kernel and plug our field function in it and get a distance estimate. 
And with this uh, line, uh, infinite line segment assumption, with this distance estimate, becomes exact. And the squared version of it, uh, let me show you the figures. And the squared version of it is a quadratic for any arbitrary ray. Uh, for different configuration where this assumption does not hold, we observe that it is a plausible starting point for our polynomial interpolation. And most importantly, uh, we have the same roots, so we can use it for the root finding. And here you see some example ray surface intersections uh, and some ray configurations with uh, different uh, rays. Uh, on, the, on the bottom, you see the inverted field with the original field. Uh, it turns to a linear function for areas where the behavior is close to the infinite line segment, and they always have the same rules as the original field. And we can use it for our ray surface intersection computation. And since it's a distance estimation, we can use it directly for sphere tracing. Uh, the problem we have with uh, using this as, uh, as a distance estimation for, the, for segment tracing is that it, may, uh, it becomes uh, less efficient when we have small details uh, with large uh, radiuses in the, in the scene. Uh, so we need to take, take into account the uh, smallest radius along the ray. And uh, another problem is since it's not a distance, uh, it's not an exact distance estimate because we cannot convert a distant field into a sine distant field exactly. Uh, it, it can uh, fail in some areas like in where our assumption fails around, for example, at the endpoints of the segments. And to eliminate these problems, we focus our attention back into polynomial interpolation, but this time with an adaptive interval subdivision scheme. Uh, this distance estimate we calculated uh, closely re relates to the individual scale distances between each line segment primitive and the ray. And uh, here you see uh, three primitives and their squared distances for illustration. Two and three. And we see that uh, this inverted uh, field uh, is uh, closely correlates to this distance and similar to a smoothed version of it. And we take advantage of this correlation and use these distances minimal points uh, to subdivide the ray intervals. Uh, this provides a better heuristic compared to dividing the ray into equal size intervals as in previous methods. And uh, we should note that we calculate these minimum points of distances on our scale distance uh, formulation. And you can check the details of the derivation in the paper for this. And the important thing is this subdivision captures the field variation so that we can fit low degree polynomials for root finding uh, for each uh, individual interval. We can we use it for polynomial finding. Uh, and once we have the subintervals, we start interpolation. We fit, the, we fit quadratic polynomials using the field, uh, field values and directional derivatives at the field endpoints, and find roots on these uh, quadratic polynomials. And we make the intervals it iteratively smaller until we reach the precision we wanted. And here you see uh, different interpolation techniques for the same uh, two points. Uh, the blue curve shows the cubic Hermite interpolation where, the, where we match all the point values and their derivatives. If you want to have a quadratic with the scheme, we only have uh, three degrees of freedom, but we have four values. So uh, on green, you see where we fit a quadratic by disregarding one of the endpoint derivatives. And on the red curve, you see uh, how we fit a quadratic by part uh, using all the information we have and we can uh, calculate it so that uh, we are able to use all the information and still fit the uh, cubic interpolation at the middle point.
Uh, on the right, you see another configuration for the same uh, curves uh, and using interpolation by two parts. We use all the information we have. And here you see the comparison of interpolation there are between quadratic interpolation and cubic interpolation. Uh, on the uh, blue curves show the uh, quadratic interpolation on the inverted field that we show that behaves close to the quadratic uh, behavior. And on the red curves are the cubic interpolation on the original field. Uh, we see that even if we use a lower degree interpolation, we are able to get similar results due to the behavior of the inverted field. And since the starting point of the iterative uh, interpolation does not exactly correspond to the normalized field where we use the minimum point of the distances between uh, segments and the ray, uh, we use uh, rational quadratic polynomials until we isolate a root uh, so that we have better control while still keeping the low degree interpolation uh, low degree polynomials for fast and robust calculations. And here uh, we see a more problematic case uh, in the middle interval where uh, the field does not behave as we intended in the first place, but still we are able to reach uh, the route in very few steps. Uh, we also allow one step of uh, backtracking in case we have a discarded an interval prematurely. Uh, now I will uh, go over some results with comparisons. And here you see a visual comparison uh, between uh, our method and sphere tracing. Uh, we use the same acceleration structures for a fair comparison so that you see the uh, uh, you see the support er at around the segments. And here lighter colors means more steps taken along the ray. Uh, we need much fewer uh, field function evaluations to calculate race surface interse intersections, so it allows us to have a faster rendering. And this is especially significant for where we have grazing rays that, that goes closer to the surface and where we have large variation in the radius. I have a small video here, yes, it's working. And here you see uh, some examples with high blending and small details. Uh, rendering times here are given in milliseconds, average over full rotations around the object. Uh, our methods uh, provide faster rendering than sphere tracing and direct polynomial approximation with constant interval sizes. So we have much less uh, intervals than uh, dividing the rays into constant sized in more intervals. Uh, and this uh, previous polynomial approximation method as we said in the beginning, can lose small details depending on the ray configuration. Uh, and increasing the number of subdivision just increases the run times. Uh, here in this example, we only have four subdivisions per primitive, but it's slower. It's still slower than our method. So if you want to increase the quality, we need to increase the computational time. Uh, and when we compare with sphere tracing, uh, we show that uh, it is still slower than our method, and also we need to uh, limit the maximum of marching steps since it's a marching, uh, ray marching method, and this can create holes on the surface when we, again, when we have small details, it can, uh, it can stop prematurely or to eliminate, it, to eliminate it, if we increase the number of steps, it just takes too much time. And in this example, uh, we show that we can change the scale of the uh, kernel, for example, for uh, real-time modeling purposes. And uh, here are some more complex examples uh, that are generated procedurally. Uh, we reach real-time, depending on the object, or near real-time rates for these examples. Uh, in particular, for the example in the middle, uh, we have millions of skeleton primitives, and each of them is smoothly blended with each other. And on, for that, uh, on a high-end GPU, we reach around 60 frames per second. And here's a, a detailed render of the same object. And this concludes my presentation. And thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, amazing. <laughs>
Um, any questions from the audience? So, ah, yes, Anna. <laughs> Here comes the microphone. So I, I can imagine what the answer to this would be, but this, this uh, image you have here with sort of other rendering algorithms would probably be too prohibitive to even imagine yes, rendering. Yes, exactly. So can you easily add transparency to this? Uh, we are working on it, and it's on our short paper this afternoon, if you want to check it. Ah, great. <laughs> <laughs> a plug for the short paper, so come see the short paper from Milika this afternoon. Okay, any more questions from the audience? We do have some time. Anna has another one. Uh, I'll give you mine. Um, so how much, so I, I get this method is, is faster in, in general because you do fewer sphere intersections. Uh, does how much overhead does this polynomial um, approximation add actually to? Uh, it is done on the fly so it doesn't add any overhead overhead okay. compared to just doing sphere tracing uh, alone. Uh, actually for sphere tracing uh, if we need to calculate the Lipschitz bounds locally it increases more overhead compared to okay. this <laughs> method so this is everything that is computed on the fly I was wondering, so the, what you showed in the beginning, the formulation looks very much like uh, blobby objects, if you yes. have the Gaussians, or if you use the polynomial version, actually like metaballs, so yes. it, it goes very far back in the history of computer graphics. Mm -hmm. So does it generalize to this? So if you collapse the lines to points, will exactly, you get exactly yeah. the, met and, and will it also accelerate those uh, in the same way? Uh, yes, but our uh, seg using segment primitives, it just makes the formulation more complicated. So it, it can also, I mean, it's much easier because uh, we only have uh, point centers for the metaballs and blobby objects. Okay, but uh, would you still, I mean, all the methods you introduced, is there something in there that would still make rendering metaballs and blobby objects faster, or do you, or are there native methods for those two uh, primitives that make this naturally faster than if you introduce your uh, use your method? Uh, actually, more than our method, the molecular rendering method I mentioned, it is much closer to those objects. Yeah, from Stefan Krupp. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Okay, more questions from the audience. This has overwhelmed everybody. So I was uh, I'm talking about overwhelming. I, I mean, was I was amazed by the by, by the complexity of, of the different steps you had and so on. And still, you get a really fast method. So how how difficult is this to implement? I mean, do you get thousands of lines of codes and shader code and so on, or does this actually? all of this complexity that you kind of work through, do you work, does this boil down to actually more simple code in the end? Uh, actually, our main loop is not that complicated, I can say. Uh, we have uh, closed form expressions for, the, for evaluations for each step, actually. So I wouldn't say it's that complicated. It's not complicated, okay, that's good. <laughs> Okay, any, let's see whether, is there something, is, uh, other questions from the audience or maybe from, yeah, there is one, Tami, please. Thanks. So, instead of having line segments, <laughs> would it make sense to try with triangles? Because the generalization of that kind of skeleton is the, the median axis transform and mm -hmm. you can model like way more shapes with uh, triangles and sheets of surface onto which you define the interpolation of a sphere? Uh, yes, it can be extended to like uh, 2D skeletons as uh, triangles. Uh, I don't think there is any prohibition there, but it's uh, uh, calculation, it's a bit more complex, but it can be applied. Thanks. Maybe related to transparency, I mean, this is maybe not directly related to work because it's probably holds for all of these methods, but what, if you want to add materials or textures or so to these surfaces, mm -hmm. do you have, is there any natural way how to do that? Yeah, we can uh, add that because with this we only find the ray intersections and we, we are able to compute the derivatives at uh, each point uh, because our 
uh, our area is most based on uh, rendering for modeling uh, applications. We didn't extend into that part. If you have a um, kind of procedural definition of a texture, so it would then probably mm -hmm. be easy to evaluate, especially when you get the uh, derivatives. I guess if you have a volumetric texture, so that should be only good. Uh, it needs a little bit more, more work for uh, volumetric textures. Okay. It will be directly implemented. So I will take a final look at our online participants who have been unfortunately very quiet so far. There were no questions from online, so maybe people should come here next time <laughs> and sit with us here in the audience. So thank you for this great presentation, for this great and amazing work. Thank you for Thank giving you. this presentation and let's have a big hand for Milika. And this concludes our first uh, real life in-person session of Eurographics uh, for full papers after this very long pause. It was very, uh, very, I was very happy to be able to chair this and with this, uh, have a nice coffee break. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.